Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke in chapter number 17. Luke in chapter number 17, and we'll begin reading in verse number 20. If you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. Honor the Word of God this morning. Luke chapter number 17, beginning in verse number 20. I'll read aloud as you follow along. Uh, the Bible says, Luke chapter number 17, beginning in verse number 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven shineth unto another part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things, and be rejected of this generation. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, might you illuminate to us the truth. Lord, we are here today to worship you. Lord, you are to take first place. Lord, that we would put aside all other things, things that we have been burdened by, things that we are weighing us down. Lord, things that uh, we're struggling with. Lord, whatever they are, Lord, I pray that we would uh, set those aside and let you ourselves be engaged in worship of you, Lord, and in turn, you will help us with those things. And Lord, I pray that you would use the scriptures not only to increase our knowledge, Lord, but that our actions would be different and that our lives would be different because of the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. In verse number 20, the Pharisees ask, well, they, I, I take that back, they don't even ask a question. Something is demanded of Jesus by the Pharisees. It says in verse number 20, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, and they asked this question, they demanded of him when the kingdom of God should come. Help us, under, first we need to understand what they're talking about, the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, there are promises to the children of Israel that, that a king would come and would reign, would come in the line of David and would reign. Those those promises are in the Old Testament, and they are true, and friend, they will be fulfilled. Amen. The king is coming. And so there's this misunderstanding amongst the Jews, and to be honest, even with the disciples, that the purpose that Christ had come at this point was to set up his kingdom on the earth, and they were ready for him to overthrow the Romans and set up the kingdom and be ready just to, to, to rule and to reign in the line of David. But the problem was that something had to take place first. And even the disciples, as we have gone through the book of Luke, have seen the disciples over and over and over again have this idea that here we go, the kingdom is here. Even as you go into the crucifixion, if you remember there in the book of Matthew in chapter number 27, when, when, they, when they come to take Jesus away and Peter will take a sword and begin to fight to try to bring in the kingdom... And Jesus tells, uh, tells Peter that all Scripture must be fulfilled first. It's after this disillusionment that Peter will then deny the Lord. The disciples even had this idea that Christ had come to set up the earthly kingdom now. And take your Bibles and turn over the book of Acts. And uh, he has instructed them that first his death must occur. Here in the book of Acts in chapter number 1, we're going to see that the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has taken place, excuse me, has taken place. And what is the very first question that the disciples ask Jesus? He has, he has been uh, risen, he has, he has met with them, and now he's about to ascend. And this important question that they're going to ask him in verse number 6. He has instructed them that the Holy Ghost is coming, and uh, he's going to tell them in verse number 8 that there'll be witnesses Verse number six, and when they were therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And the disciples were very concerned about this earthly kingdom, about Christ reigning. But Christ tells them in verse number seven, He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season 
which the Father has put into his own power. He says, not for you to know when that kingdom is going to be set up. There's something that there's, that's going to happen first. And first, you're going to be witnesses to me. Verse number 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We hear that nowadays and we think, man, oh, what a blessing it is that the gospel's gone out to all the world. But think of that verse in contrast to what they just asked him. Wilt thou now restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it time for Israel to take center stage and for you to reign in the line of David? Now again, don't misunderstand me. That time is coming. Israel will take center stage and Jesus will reign. But he said, no, not yet. You're you're misunderstanding the point. Before I reign with a rod of iron, I want you, the church, to be a witness to me, not of my ruling power, but of my saving power. Amen. And that power, that witness is going to be to Jerusalem. And you can hear him go, yes, Israel. And he says, but not only Jerusalem, but also Judea. And they go, all right, we're from there. But also Samaria. You can kind of see the disciples go, ooh, them too? Not only Samaria, but unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And he was helping them to understand that there's something that's going to take place about this kingdom before the earthly kingdom will come about. There will be those that will enter into the kingdom of God, but it will not be a flesh and blood. It will be a kingdom of spirit. Go back to Luke chapter number 17. It gives us this idea. The the Pharisees. You can see where the opposition begin to go and the Pharisees are demanding, well, if you are going to be king, if you are Messiah, when's the kingdom going to start? When are you going to start going to rule? When are you going to start uh, putting down this Roman oppression? When are you going to elevate yourself to be something more than just hanging out with these fishermen and going around and, and healing the people and, and preaching these things? When is the kingdom going to start? And he explains to them in verse number 21, in verse number 20, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It's not going to be of an earthly kingdom. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Hey, can I clue you into something? I am in the kingdom of God. I am in the kingdom of God. I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. My sins have been forgiven. I'm a citizen of heaven. I know that forever my eternity is settled. I am in the kingdom of God. And I'll be able to enjoy and celebrate when that kingdom becomes earthly. But I don't have to wait for that because the kingdom is already here within you, he said. They're confused about that. So he goes on and he explains some things. And he says to his disciples, The day will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. And you shall not see it. You're going to desire for this to take place, for the kingdom to rule. He says, but there's other things that are more important than that earthly rule. He says, in that kingdom, for the lightning and the, uh, for as the lightning that lighteth out one part of them under, under heaven, shineth to another part under heaven, so shall the, also the Son of Man be in his day. Friend, when his kingdom comes, when his kingdom begins, it's going to happen first with a rapture. It's going to be in a moment and a twinkling of the eye. And it will happen just like that. And you won't have time to get ready. You won't have time at that point to choose sides. Go over with me and we'll look at it in a minute. But if you look up here in verse number 31. In that day, which he shall say, uh, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house Let him not come down and take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life uh, shall preserve it. There's not going to be time for choosing sides then. There's not going to be time for saying, okay, okay, I finally believe the things of God. I, I finally believe in Jesus. Friend, the time will be done at that point. He says the kingdom of God is going to happen just like that. Then he gives the statements. We're going to come back to verse number 25. But he gives these statements about Noah and about Lot. Verse number 26. And it says, 
And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat and drink, and were and they married wives and were given in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and drank and they brought and they sold and they planted and they builded. But the same day Lot went out of Sodom and it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. There are many that point to these examples and say, see, when Christ returns, it's going to be as wicked as it was in the days of Noah. It's going to be as wicked as it was in the days of Lot. And though, friend, we know from Scripture that things will wax worse and worse and wickedness will rule, the point of the illustration is not the wickedness of the days, but the quickness of the destruction. There was just another day when the door shut behind the ark. It was just another day when Lot left Sodom. It's just another day. You know what they were doing on that day when the, when the door shut at the ark? They weren't going, I wonder if it's today. I wonder if the flood could come. And, and you know what they were doing? Having meals. Having a wedding. Do you have a wedding? If you, would you plan your wedding for the day of destruction? Probably not. They did not know the destruction was coming. There in Sodom, they were buying Somebody on the day that Sodom was destroyed went and looked at a piece of property and said, man, whoa, in about eight months, I'm going to have a house here. It's going to look beautiful. Man, I love this piece of property overlooking the lake. I'm going to have a dock out in the back. It's going to be nice. What do you think about it, honey? She's like, man, that looks really nice. It's not about, the, though those places were wicked, and though the world will be wicked at the return of Christ, it's about the immediacy of the destruction. It's about the immediacy of the return. They just thought it was another day. Then it happened. He says that's what the kingdom of God, when it comes, it's going to come like that. It's going to begin like that. He said, but something first must happen. Verse number 25. But first, he... The Son of Man, in verse number 24, he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. This is a parallel passage there to Mark. Take your Bibles and turn back over to the book of Mark in chapter number 8 and verse number 31. And we we'll see a little bit more information even that he gives here and that Mark uh, is recorded to give here. In Mark chapter number 8 and verse number 31. Now remember who's in, this, who's in this crowd. The Pharisees are saying, when's the kingdom coming? When are you going to begin to rule? Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now can you understand what's taking place in this whole process? The Pharisees, and to some extent the disciples, as we have looked in this Gospel of Luke, are wanting victory. They're wanting victory, and that victory is going to be ascribed as an earthly kingdom where they are uh, winning over the Romans, where they're setting up this kingdom. Remember the debates and when uh, James and John's mother says, when, when, when we come into thy kingdom, my one son sit on thy right hand, and thy one son sit on thy left hand. Back there in Luke chapter number 8, when they're walking around, what are they discussing? Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? They're all concerned about this earthly kingdom about being about being able to conquer but they're missing something there it is impossible for anyone to be successful in an earthly sense or a physical sense without first having the kingdom of your heart to be conquered and your sins be forgiven and that that anger of god being satisfied so that your sins can be removed even up to this point you know what was happening in jerusalem they were making sacrifices of the animals so that their sin could be rolled over. Their sin was not forgiven by that sacrifice. It was simply rolled over. It was simply rolled over. Boy, in the days of these uh, financial issues, you know, a lot of times uh, people do all sorts of things with their mortgages. Can you imagine somebody saying, man, I'm having a difficult time with my mortgage and the bank calls and they said, we have a solution for you. 
What's the solution? You don't have to pay for a year. Wouldn't that be nice? You don't have to pay for a year. Well, then what happens? Well, next year, we're just going to add all that interest to the mortgage. But it's okay. You don't have to pay for a year. And you hang up the phone and you go out and tell your friends, man, this is awesome. I have been freed from my mortgage. Have you been freed from your mortgage? No, you just have had it pushed back for a year. Boy, in the next year, January 1, they call you up and say, we've got a great deal for you. We're going to roll your mortgage back again another year. You don't have to pay for your mortgage this year. You're like, man, this is awesome. But do you understand that as they roll it over year after year after year and push back the requirement, eventually payday comes. Eventually it is required of you that you pay that mortgage. Man, imagine the mountain of that mortgage as they keep rolling it back and rolling it back. And that's exactly what was happening in the Old Testament. They would have these sacrifices not because it washed away their sins, but it would appease God according to the law and roll their sin back for another year and roll their sin back for another year. But eventually, somebody is going to have to pay. You roll your mortgage back and it's been 10 years you haven't paid on your mortgage. What started out as a $100,000 mortgage is now hmm, a lot more as the interest keeps piling on. And finally, the bank says, January 1, hey, you called me up to let me know you could roll my mortgage back again? No, no, today we want you to pay. How much do I got to pay? We want you to pay it in full. We want you to pay the whole thing off. Um, I'm not going to be able to do that right now. Maybe you can call me back in a couple weeks. Something will have changed. Are you going to be able to pay that mortgage? No. Impossible. There's nothing that would be, enable you to do that as you've rolled that back. Imagine the years that have taken place under the law and the sin has been rolled back but they may not enter into the kingdom. They may not go into heaven without having their sins forgiven. The Bible tells us in Mark and also in Luke, you know what needs to happen first before the kingdom, the kingdom can be enhanced, before the kingdom can be brought in, somebody has to pay. Somebody has to pay. It says this in verse number 25, but first he must suffer many things. He must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. You know, sometimes people are confused to simply think that Jesus was just a man that lived in history and died. A religious man, a teacher, he died. And we follow his teachings because it's a good moral code. Can I tell you something? Jesus was more than just a man. He was the God man. He was the Alpha and the Omega he was God, very God. He was in the beginning with God. And not only was he with God, he was God. And he was sinless and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And only he would have the ability to pay for the sins. But not just the sins of one person, but for the sins of all the world. Boy, and we know that verse, we see it everywhere. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who did He give His Son for? For the sins of the whole world. First John, not for your sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And these Pharisees are here asking about their kingdom. Asking about how things can be made better in this life. Asking how, God's gonna, how Jesus is going to help them now. He says, no, no, something's got to take place first. Somebody's got to pay for your sins. Somebody has to pay for those sins. It says in verse number 25 that he must suffer many things. There's two elements that he mentions here. He elaborates on it there in Mark and see how he's rejected by the elders and re rejected by the religious system. But it's, it's all put together in this verse. First, he must suffer 
many things. Can I tell you, people say salvation is free. Salvation doesn't cost anything. Friends, salvation costs a whole lot. When we think of those days when Jesus died. When Jesus, we were over in Jerusalem a couple years ago and they had done, they had dug up the, the Herodian palace where, where Herod had lived and it's all very compact. You know, we, we sometimes look at the scripture thinking, how did he walk from Pilate to Herod to Pilate and that, that fortress there in Jerusalem where Pilate was residing and they had excavated the whole thing original this it's not it's not they didn't replace it and it's not a replica they had just dug it up it was all there we were down in the basement of that uh, fortress and they were showing us on the ground some markings and it was a it was really like a game board that had been carved into the ground and they said this game board is how the roman soldiers would play games with the prisoners and it would, you'd have pieces and they'd blindfold the prisoners and you'd either hit them or pull on their beard or do something. And, and if you caused a certain amount of blood, you can move on the spaces or, or try to get the person to guess and all these things. And we were thinking there, I was sitting there watching, go, wow. I'm thinking, man, that must have been something. And then she said, no, this is the floor. This is the place where Jesus stood. This is the place where they begin to pluck out his beard. And they platted the crown of thorns upon his head. And they began to beat him. And they put that robe of purple around him to mock him. He must suffer many things. And how they scourged him. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that his, visage, his image was marred so much that he didn't even look like a man. Is this beast or man? He had been beaten so badly. His skin had been opened so much. I remember as a young person, a man preaching, and he had brought with him a cat of nine tails. And he showed us how they, the long strips of leather that made up that whip and how they would weave into that pieces of metal or glass or rock. And they would take that and they would whip it and literally they wanted it to wrap around the individual and then they would pull it out and it would just pull all chunks of flesh with them. And I was sitting there as a young person and my my first thought, my first thought is, oh, that's that's so gross. My second thought was, that was real. That was real. He must suffer many things. He's brought there before Pilate, and Pilate has said, I found no fault in him. And eventually he has chosen, there's the choice to be made between Jesus and Barabbas. And he's standing there in this purple robe with the thorns upon his head. The blood that is already beginning to pour from the open wombs, and the chance is given. Who do you choose? Jesus or Barabbas? What do they cry? Barabbas. Not only did he suffer those things, he was also rejected. Rejected of men. And then, of course, they put the cross upon him. They made him walk up Golgotha. There they laid him down on that cross. Can you imagine? I can't even imagine. I know these Roman soldiers, crucifixion was something that had taken place very often. They had done this before. And I imagine every other time when they had gone to to nail the hands down of that individual, they had to pry his arms down. But the Bible says Christ laid down his life. No man took it. And he laid upon that cross and he spread his arms out. And let that Roman soldier begin to beat the nails into his hands. And beat the nails into his feet. Eventually they lifted him up and dropped him into that hole. And there he stood suspended between heaven and earth. Not just a man dying for what he believes. Not just a rabbi that had been rejected by his followers. But God dying in the place of man. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 that it pleased God to bruise him. By his stripes we are healed and God 
took all the sin of all mankind, all the sin that has ever been committed, from the sin of Adam to the last sin that will ever take place before the final judgment, he took all the sin of all mankind. You say, how can God do that? Let me give you the easy answer. He's God. The Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter number 18, which is really God's picture of the crucifixion, that God clothed himself in darkness and he reached out and he bowed the heavens. Literally, you study it, it means this. He, he, he took all the heavens and began to bend them and he, he held back because he could have just crumpled the whole thing up like a piece of paper and thrown all creation away. And God, who is outside of time, Plenty of scripture that tells us that God is outside of time. And on that very day, God could look into the past, into the present, into the future, and grab the sins of all mankind before Christ and all mankind after Christ and take all the sins of all mankind. And not only did he die for us, the Bible says he died as us. He became sin who knew no sin. In other words, on the cross, when God put the sin of all mankind, it became as if Christ had committed every one of those sins. And God turns his back on the Son. First time in all eternity that there has been a break in fellowship between God the Father and God the Son. And Jesus Christ hung there in payment for your sin and for my sin. And eventually, he died for us. He gave up the ghost, the Bible says. He committed his spirit, and he died. There's all sorts of speculation even at that time. Perhaps he did not die. Friend, he died. And he was laid in that tomb. But then, as Paul will later write, O death, Where is thy victory? O grave, where is thy sting? Because once the payment has been made and the blood has been shed, through the power of God, through the power of Christ, he arose again. Man, what a beautiful thing. He arose again. Now, can I give you the picture in heaven? There in heaven, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, there's a mercy seat. There's a mercy seat. There is an accounting that has been taken place. For every sin, for every activity, for every thought, there has been an accounting that has taken place. Nothing escapes the mind of God. And that has all been accounted for. And we are accountable for it. There the picture is given when Christ comes into heaven. And guess what he brings with him? The shed blood. And he goes before the mercy seat. And he places his blood upon the mercy seat. Which means that the anger of God has been satisfied. The anger of God has been appeased. The judgment of God can now be averted. Because sacrifice has been made. A sufficient sacrifice has been made. And there does no longer has to be payment for that. Because the payment has been made. The mortgage company calls you and says, we've put off your mortgage for 25 years. Interest has grown. You owe more money than we can even tell you. How are you going to pay it? You say, I can't pay it. And someone comes in and says, I'll pay your mortgage for you. I'll pay your mortgage for you. I'll pay the whole thing. You'll owe zero. That would be a good day, wouldn't it? To owe zero on your mortgage. And he takes out his checkbook and he says, now who do I make this out to? And you go, oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. I've got to earn this mortgage. I've got to work and work. Can I tell you what's going to happen first before you pay off your mortgage? You're going to die. That's what's going to happen. You would not have the means to be able to do it. 
Here's what I'm going to do. I, I don't want you to write that check for me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call the mortgage people and get their birthdays and, and send them cards for Christmas. I'm going to just be kind to them and I'm going to send them love letters and just tell them how much I appreciate them. Is that going to take care of your mortgage? No. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll keep the house really, really clean. I mean, I'll, I'll mow the yard and I'll, I'll make everything perfect. I mean, the house will be perfectly clean. Is that going to pay your mortgage? There's only one way to pay your mortgage. It's to accept the payment of another. That's the only way. And there will be those that stand before God. At the judgment, He says, why should I let you into heaven? And they said, hey, we did a lot of good stuff. Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in Thy name? And did we not prophesy in Thy name? We Look at all the stuff we did. There's only one problem. Those things that you do do not take away the sin that you've done. The good things you do do not take away the sin that you've done. Yeah, but, but I fixed my life and I no longer do those bad things anymore. I, I've overcome. I no longer given in to those things anymore. I, I don't do the sin anymore. Stopping the sin does not take away the sin that you've done. There's only one way to have your sins removed, forgiven, justified. There's only one way. By accepting the payment of another. The problem is that we begin to think, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow. You know, if you were to look at this, Luke chapter number 18 really is talking about the end times, but it's not nearly as detailed as Matthew chapter number 24. And I think the purpose for that is this was not Luke's recording of it. was not a dissertation on this is how these things are going to happen. It's an emotional recording that tells us that this is going to take place. The kingdom of God is going to come like lightning. It's going to come very fast. And can I tell you, you must receive the Son of Jesus Christ who died in your place first. And we say tomorrow... There's going to come a time when one will stay and one will be taken. It continues to tell us that, verse number 31 to verse number 37, that one will be taken and one will stay. Verse 35, two women shall be grinding together and one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field and one shall be taken and the other left. They answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever that the body is whither will the eagles be gathered together it'll happen just like that at that point there will be no time to reconsider no time to step back and say hey maybe i should look at this differently they want to know where the kingdom is he says man first i must be crucified well guess where we are he has been crucified this is, this is so profound. You think we're closer to the return of Christ today than we were that day? His return could be at any time. You say, but his death was 2,000 years ago. What does it do for me? His death provides salvation for any that would put their faith and trust that he shed his blood for them and can forgive their sins for all eternity. Let me implore you don't say tomorrow. The Bible says for today is the day of salvation. Yeah, but I don't think I'm good enough to receive it. Well, join the crowd, friend. None of us are good enough to receive it. Well, maybe I should do some good things first. You know what that'd be like? That man's that's going to pay your mortgage and you go, oh, hold on a second. I don't want you to pay all of it. I'd like to pay some. He says, how much you got? I got four bucks. I got four bucks right here in my pocket. The Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, are of no value. It must be the righteousness of Christ in us. These men this day, the Pharisees on that day, 
walked away disappointed. Well, he didn't even answer our question. When's the kingdom of God coming? And they missed the point. He is the kingdom of God. And he provides an opportunity for the forgiveness of sins to all mankind. And here we are over 2,000 years later, and there will be many that will walk away going, ah, maybe tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Put your faith and trust in Christ. Accept what His Son did upon the cross as your payment for your sin. And believe in Him. The Bible says He will make you a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's pray.